Cancer is not only a microevolutionary process. As with standard biological evolution, microevolution is a process that produces a pattern, macroevolution, that we can study with molecular phylogenetics. It turns out that the evolutionary history of individual cancers is longer than we had anticipated. Cancer phylogenies do reveal some convergent evolution. The heterogeneity revealed by phylogenies is also pointing to problems for therapies that are targeted to single samples. Molecular phylogeography of brain tumors shows that multiple clones survive chemotherapy and that are occupying different positions, and this also points to the complexity of therapy. Analysis of phylogenetic trees of cancers revealed that therapy with NSAIDs, non-steroidal uh, inflammatory drugs, reduced the rate of acquisition of somatic mutations, and that suggests why NSAIDs reduce cancer risk. We'll step through this. Here is one study of a number of patients who had pancreatic cancer. And what you see here is a phylogenetic tree sketched out, running uh, from old to young, from top to bottom. It starts with a normal epithelial cell in a duct in the pancreas. A, a tumor cell starts with a mutation. There is a process of clonal evolution in which the dark blue clones are eliminated by competition. That results in a parental clone. What they mean here is parental for the metastasis. It yields then a set of subclones that have metastatic capacity. And they then go out from the pancreas and were recovered when the patients died in lung and liver. Look at how long that took. It took about 12 years for this process of clonal evolution to go on then about seven years for the subclones to build up with metastatic capacity, and from metastasis to death was on average about three years. Normally, the cancer is not detected until this point. So we usually think of pancreatic cancer as killing quickly, but in these cases, it started at least 18 years before the patients died. So there was clonal selection and the diagnosis came too late. There was some local adaptation of the metastases to lung and to liver. Another example of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. What you have here is the ancestor and the names that are given in the boxes are labeling the ways that we recognize the subclones. So this is the probable ancestor, and these are the origins of the different subclones. They're from one cancer patient. The numbers of copies in the different clones is in front of the gene name. So for example, this is starting off with one copy here, two of these, one of these, and two of these. And if you look down here, you can see a clone which is lacking any of those genes, so they've been deleted, and they've also been deleted down here, but it's picked up extra copies of this gene. So there are processes of deletion and duplication, which is, are going on. No single clone replaced all of the others. There had been repeated loss of copy number variants in two genes, PAX5 and ETV6, and that generated a lot of genetic heterogeneity, which hadn't in that case been completely resolved. Here is a case of renal cell carcinoma, and this one is analyzed in great detail. And it shows that there's been evolutionary divergence among clones that are persisting, and that evolutionary divergence poses real problems for therapy. So a primary tumor in this case on the kidney sent metastases into the lung and into the chest wall. Both the primary tumor and the metastases consisted of sets of clones. They weren't simple. They were genetically heterogeneous. Therapies that were designed to treat the primary tumor would miss the variation in the metastases, so that would be ineffective. Therapies designed to treat one metastasis would miss variation in the others. Normally, this is done by taking a biopsy, and the problem is that a biopsy would normally be 
coming from just one metastasis. So they were sequenced and what you can see here are mutations that are in different samples. So the samples are the rows and the mutations are in genes, which are the columns. And the ubiquitous mutations are the ones which are found in many different samples. Then there are some shared primary mutations which are shared among a few samples in the primary tumor. Then there are some shared mutations in metastases. However, these are all of the private mutations over here. So these are found only in individual samples. So gray is the mutation is present, blue is that it's absent. The purple gene names are that the mutation was validated, those are these, and the orange gene names, it's where validation failed, there are a few of those. The point of the picture is that in a cancer like this, this is a kidney cancer that's metastasized into the chest and lung. There is such a huge amount of genetic variation that a sample from one part of the primary tumor or from only one of the metastases is not going to give characteristics that could lead to the cure of the whole thing. It's too diverse. So this is another way to look at all of that genetic heterogeneity in that kidney cancer. Here we see a phylogenetic tree. The mutations that are ubiquitous are in blue, and the branch length here is proportional to the number of non-synonymous mutations. So it basically is a measure of how much selection is going on. The potential driver mutations are indicated by arrows here. The shared primary uh, mutations are along this orange branch, the shared metastatic mutations are along this green branch, and then the private mutations, the ones that are unique to individual clones, are in red. The point here is that we need to treat the branches, not the twigs. We need to be able to find ways of targeting things that are shared by all the cells that are causing the problem. Another example comes from a glioblastoma, and this was a molecular phylogenetic investigation of a cancer. Following chemotherapy, the surviving population was not a single resistant clone, but there were multiple clones that had different mutations for resistance. Glioblastoma is a brain cancer. Unless the treatments eliminated all of the clones, the survivors would persist and probably flourish. So again, a single biopsy of one branch will not be a sample that's sufficient to indicate the problems that are posed by a tree. There's another kind of uh, useful information we can gain about cancers using phylogenetic methods. So this again is the system in which Barrett's esophagus progresses to esophageal adenocarcinomas. And here we're using phylogenetic inference to see how effective is therapy using non-steroidal inflammatory drugs, anti-inflammatory drugs. In this case, we have individuals that are indicated by letters A through M, and we can see whether or not they were on or off the NSAID, and then look at the somatic genomic abnormalities per genome per year. So these are individuals who are being followed, they're being sampled. At some point they start getting treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Samples are being taken from their Barrett's esophagus and in those samples we are looking at what is the frequency of any kind of somatic genomic abnormality. So both point mutations, abnormal chromosome numbers and so forth. As this makes clear, the drug reduced the rate of the acquisition of these abnormalities tenfold. So anti-inflammatory drugs are reducing the rates of mutation that lead to cancer. To summarize, molecular phylogenetics can describe the history of the evolution of a metastatic cancer in a single patient. The evidence for cancer is a process of clonal evolution is now overwhelming. Cancers originate earlier, they are older, 
than we had expected. Single biopsies of primary tumors seriously underestimate the clonal heterogeneity of metastases. They are diff the heterogeneity is difficult to sample. We have to, however, treat the entire tree, not the single branch that's sampled in a single biopsy. Thus, phylogenetic inference is another tool that we can use to evaluate the effectiveness of preventive and therapeutic medicine for cancer.